I want you to get together. Hello everyone. I have a bit of an off-the-cuff random rumination video for you uh, here today. And this is just something I want to discuss um, openly with you guys and maybe share with you a passage from my book as well, where I've been looking into this recently. Um, but it's on the topic of the Mark of Cain. Um, now, I'll just uh, share my screen with you so you can see what I've been looking at here. But uh, just on a brief overview, I understand that the Mark of Cain has been you know, contested for since you know, biblical theology has been a thing. People have been arguing about just what exactly this mark even is. Um, and there is no set agreed upon answer. It says here, you know, on the basic Wikipedia search, you know, um, the curse of Cain and the mark of Cain are phrases that originate in the story of Cain and Abel in the book of Genesis. In these stories, if someone harmed Cain, the damage would come back on them sevenfold. Some interpretations view this as a physical mark, whereas other interpretations see the mark as a sign and not a physical mark on Cain himself. The King James Version of the Bible reads it set a mark upon Cain. Now, there's no clear consensus as to what Cain's mark was. The word translated as mark in Genesis 4.15 is ut, which means a sign, an omen, a warning, remembrance, motion, gesture, agreement, miracle, wonder, or most commonly, a letter. In the Torah, the same word is used to describe the stars as signs or omens, the rainbow as the sign of God's promise to never again destroy his creation with a flood, for example, or the circumcision as a token of God's covenant with Abraham, and the miracles performed by Moses before the Pharaoh. The narrative of the curse of Cain is found in the text of Genesis 4, 11, 16. The curse was a result of Cain murdering his brother Abel and lying about the murder of God. When Cain spilt his brother's blood, the earth became cursed as soon as the blood hit the ground. In a sense, the earth was left drinking Abel's blood. It gives a two-part sentencing for Cain's curse. The first concerns the earth that was cursed by Abel's blood. Should Cain attempt to farm the land, the earth would not yield any produce for him. This may imply why he went out to build cities, namely the city of Enoch. The second part of the curse marks Cain as a fugitive, a wanderer. The combination making up the Hebrew phrase fugitive and wanderer is unique to the Hebrew Bible. Modern interpretations of the Hebrew verse 12 suggest that Cain went on to live a nomadic lifestyle as a hunter-gatherer, and he was excluded from the family unit. In the Septuagint, the emphasis on Cain's curse is dramatically increased by the combination of the Greek, print, um, part, the Greek participles <laughs> groaning and shaking upon the earth. Interprets the Greek version to mean that Cain experienced a real physical affliction that would enable others to know who he was when they saw him. Right, so you get the gist there. Mark, you know, this mark on Cain, it was either something visible or something spiritual in nature, but um, whatever it was, it made it clear to anybody who saw him that they would not have anything to do with him. Don't kill him. Don't be involved. It's best just to stay away. If you do hurt this person and kill him, then you are in serious trouble. So maybe it was, you know, a, a letter of some kind that's been theorised. Others have theorised it's perhaps horns um, here. You know, God made a horn grow out of Cain's head is some examples. Um, others say that, you know, he engraved a letter of his God's name into Cain's forehead. Um, there's loads of theories as to what the physical mark would be. And while I'm doing research for my book, you know, I, I've recently written a chapter which is called Biblical Descriptions of the Nephilim, and um, as you can see on the screen here, um, chapter 12, um, I've been trying to use just only biblical text to determine the visual nature of the Nephilim, okay, um, before going on to going on to cultural descriptions of the gods, which were the Nephilim and the fallen angels outside of biblical sources. Um, so I'm trying to establish a biblical image of a Nephilim beast before I go on to, you know, use, like I said, use the cultural versions. Um, and while doing this research, I came across a book um, which is quite interesting and sheds a new angle on this whole Mark of Cain situation. 
Um, now the book is called um, the Book of um, Lamech, son of Cain. Here it is. Um, so it's the Book of Lamech, son of Cain. And it's uh, see when I see that the author is someone called Demon, or you know, looks like Demon. You've got to be a little bit uh, you know, weary about what's going on here. But from what I've read here in the introduction about the sources of this book, you know, this extra biblical, apocryphal, pseudepigraphical text, whatever, whatever you want to call it, you know, this 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 uh, book that is supposed to fit into the narrative of the Bible as like an extracurricular tale of some kind. Um, you can read that basically this book is now available for all scholars and um, it's been difficult to secure throughout history and there are two reasons for this scarcity. Um, number one, there's a similar book um, of Lamech about Noah's father. An almost complete, complete copy was found within the Dead Sea Scrolls for this. The second reason is that the church leaders have been and are deeply concerned with the blasphemous history of the antediluvian line of Cain in the book of Lamech of Cain. So, you know, as did this person concluded in the Lost Book of King Og, the suppression of the book of Lamech of Cain has to do with its disclosures of spiritual truth. The key spiritual knowledge in the book of Lamech of Cain exposes critical cracks in basic Christian theology, or so this author says. I, I don't think it really does, personally. Uh, Father Sargent's translation is, at the time, the strongest I have read of the original Ugarati. He has taken some approved liberties, but the overall message of the text comes across well. You know, so this is basically said to have been released from the Vatican very recently. That's where they're saying this book comes from. Okay, so it says here, you know, um, it was Father um, Ichabod Sargent who translated this text. And this is his foreword to the book. Um, and he's saying here, you know, the book of Lamech of Cain that you're holding your hands right now is nothing short of a great and antediluvian treasure. When my colleague, Father Esau Martin, was working on his translation of the Lost Book of King Og, he sent me an invitation to meet the lead of his seven-person translation team for dinner. The Father Martin was not present for the meal. At dinner, Father Martin's translators then made his team services available to me. He then presented me with a briefcase full of microfiche. Those uh, precious rolls would later prove the document of parchment tablets and preserved animal skins of a mostly complete Ugaratic translation of the Book of Lamech of Cain. So, to summarise here, without going too deep into all that, this is a, a book that's been released and translated and brought to the public in 2019 from the Vatican vaults. Okay, so make of that what you will. Take it all with a pinch of salt. Consider it within context. Um, and obviously, I'm not saying this is the final word of God, what you're going to read here but it's certainly fascinating to bring into the overall image that we're trying to create. And we, the things that are shared in this book about the history of what it was like to live in the antediluvian times, I would say within context of when these things were written, it's probably true that it was as brutal and horrible as described in this book. Um, though there are things that are said in this book which contradict other books, like the book of Jasher, for example, in regards to things like the death of Tubal Cain and Cain. Um, this book does contradict that and also it does give an example that um noah's wife in this book was the son uh, sorry the daughter of lamech um lamech the evil you know lamech the, the line of cain and she was a a whore who slept with giants and fallen angels and drank the blood and participated in witchcraft and sorcery and then she basically hid all of that about herself and married Noah, and she was the daughter. She was basically the mother of mankind after the flood. You know, so that obviously that's a reason to um, <laughs> for the Vatican alone to reject this and consider it blasphemy. You know, but uh, whether that's true or not to me isn't really a salvation issue. But um, it opens up some interesting questions to consider. So bear that in mind. This is not, you know, so saith the Lord. This is not um, certified truth necessarily. It's hard to say, um, but it's definitely worth taking into context and, you know, adding into the picture, I would say. So reading this book, I, I, it, I right out of the bat in the first page, it said something which I thought was very interesting in regards to the mark of Cain. So it says here, Cain, the forefather of the Mech, who was marked with leprous whiteness. For God said, whomever slays Cain, 
shall have vengeance visited upon their head sevenfold, as Abel's blood cried from the ground. The same leprous whiteness was made a sign that was visited upon the Cain's descendants, as it was their inheritance for seven generations. So what it's saying here is the mark of Cain is to have a leprous, sickly, white skin, which is interesting. And this is actually interesting that it says this and this has been released recently because it's funny because in the past I was reading on the Wikipedia page, the whole Mark of Cain thing has been used by racists and all sorts of people throughout history to justify the slavery of black people. You know, people used to stupidly say, oh, well, black people are the Mark of Cain. You know, black skin is the Mark of Cain, which is just <laughs> outrageous. And in this, it it would actually say, well, actually, the opposite is true. Having leprous white skin is the mark of Cain. (laughs) It's interesting. It goes on to explain. You can read it yourself on the Wikipedia if you want to. It talks about, you know, the curse of harm, racism and slavery, blah, 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 blah. And how the mark has been used as justification for slavery, mainly in America as well. Um, But that's neither here nor there. I just find it fascinating, the irony that this, this supposed antediluvian uh, book is claiming the complete opposite in fact that you know it's actually a uh, it's leprous whiteness <laughs> that was the mark and now why this is relevant to my work and why i've included this and how i've come across this is that i'm trying to obviously come up with biblical descriptions for the nephilim now if we consider first of all that you know the nephilim um are the offspring of fallen angels mating with the daughters of cain in the sixth generation from Jared, okay? Um, And not only that, obviously, Cain himself mixed himself with the peoples of day six, the humans that were already on earth pre-Adam, the pre-Adamites. This is basically the the history I'm creating here, you know, from the evidence I've seen, and obviously backing off the work of Gary Wayne. But it seems like when Cain was exiled from the garden, well, from his parents, you know, after killing Abel, He went to build cities and took a wife, and it seems that he may have taken a wife from these these peoples that were already around, and it seems like he spread his mark among them, you know, and it's from these people and the daughters produced through Cain's leprous white genetic marker um, that the fallen angels mated with the humans, you know, and if the fallen angels, which were serpentine seraphim-like in nature with visages like adders and vipers as described in the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, Qumran Caves version of um, the Book of Amran. Then that means serpent-like winged beings mated with incredibly porcelain, sickly, white-skinned females who had a mark genetically given to them from their forefather, which was Cain. So this might explain why we always have this common descriptor of the Nephilim having white skin. This could be an answer to, to why the white skin is such a, a prolific standard when it comes to describing the Nephilim of the past. And of course, the leprous white skin is a motif of the clowns. They white themselves up, you know, as much as they can before applying the red hair. Red hair also being another indicator of the Nephilim. So it's just fascinating that it's, it's in this book, you know, this mark of Cain was, was white skin. And it says here, you know, with this marked inheritance, Cain's descendants sought to do all was wicked on the land in the sight of the Lord, for they had been marked by him. For the descendants of Cain had received unto themselves the damnation which was their fair portion for Cain's sin. And God refused to be angered by Cain's wickedness, for Cain was not forgiven. And the descendants of Cain practised manners of evil that shall not be forgiven unto men. So God ignored the line of Cain for they were of no use to him. So, you know, this mark that, you know, and anyone who bore the mark for seven generations, it says here, you know, had this white skin, God just ignored them. He didn't even care about the bad things they were doing. He was, they were basically dead to him for what, the, for what was done, you know. You no, know, that's might be a brutal punishment, but that's literally the case. And the rest of the book, you know, goes on to explain how, um, Lamech was born, obviously, the seventh generation himself um, from there. And he was the last of the leprous white people, basically, from the curse. You know, his daughter after that, Namar, supposedly, wasn't marked with the white skin. And obviously, as I mentioned earlier, Namar, according to this book, was the one that went on to marry Noah and have, um, obviously, give birth to uh, Shem, Japheth and Ham. 
But this book also says at the very end, which is quite interesting, um, if I can get to the last page. Here we go. So it's interesting. So this is coming off the back of the idea that Lamech is 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 basically horrible. I, he's really upset because <laughs> his daughter Namar has been whoring around with the sons of God and the giants and drinking blood and doing witchcraft, and he doesn't like watching his daughter being abused and used sexually like this. So it says Lamech then laid peacefully in the grave. So he's found this hole in the ground, and he's like, I may as well be dead, for my daughter has gone of the ways of the sons of God. And he starts basically moping around in this grave, in this hole. And then he says, you know, And when he knew what to tell Namar, he came forth, bound hand and foot with grave cloths, and he loosed them and let go of them, for he loved Namar with his heart and forgave her for all, saying, I will call Namar a whore no longer, for she will be the last of her kind, and I shall prepare her for it. In all of her fornication with the sons of God, Namar never conceived, and she was never killed bearing a giant, which was what women did in that time. So that's a fascinating insight. This is where it's saying all the women who, you know, fornicated with fallen angels and gave birth to giants died hideously giving birth to them because they were giants, obviously. <laughs> but Namar never came to that. No, Namar's flesh was then corrupted. For the ways of the sons of God are not man's ways. So it seems like the Nephilim trait, the genetic engineering was given to Namar in some way by, by the fallen angels. But it says here, Namar eventually put away childish things and then later she met Noah. Before Noah and Namar wed, Lamech instructed her not to tell Noah that she had lain with the Nephilim in her youth. <laughs> Time enough had passed and Noah did not know of whom Namar had lain with. For Noah sought a wife that was upright and pure, and Namar was not those things, and none of those things were avail available to Noah at the time. Nor was Noah upright and pure, for all was corrupted. So that's obviously a highly contentious thing to say as well. Another reason why this book is not considered canon. Um, and Noah and Namar had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And this is where it gets interesting. And Ham was the palest of her children from the mark that he carried through ancestry. And the corruption that Namar fostered in secret from Noah and others, are they not told in the first book of Namar? So there's a book of Namar apparently about everything she did, <laughs> which does, isn't available to us right now. But what's interesting is that Ham was the palest of her children. So it seems that even though the seven generations were up by Namar, and Namar didn't bear the mark of Cain. She wasn't white, leprous, white, dead skin, you know. She, she looks normal and healthy. Enough to fool Noah that she was uh, of pure lineage, you know. Um, it seems like the genetic trait of the mark of Cain, of leprous whiteness, became recessive. And it was her child, Ham, where it came out as like a recessive gene of some kind. Which is quite interesting, you know. And the palest of her children, it was Ham that went on to birth the, uh, the nations of Canaan. It was Ham who had the rebellious nature built into him, um, which led him to obviously uncover his father's nakedness, which, um, you know, which ended up having his son Canaan cursed, you know, and his future generations. Um, so, yeah, uh, what is interesting here is that this mark or the nature of Cain became recessive. And uh, in my book, I went on to explain how, you know, we saw something similar happen later on in time when, with the birth of Jacob and Esau. And uh, Jacob was born a normal, plain man, as it's described in the Bible. But Esau was born beast-like and hairy with covered in red hair. And he became a hunter, you know, and an uncivilized being while Jacob and went on to be a tent dweller, you know, and an upright standing citizen type of thing. Um, it just shows that maybe this, obviously, this this recessive Cain gene is kind of in mankind, perhaps, and it's so kind of diluted down now and uh, through through breeding, you know, and and generations after generations of watering down the genetic trait and marker, that we don't really see such dramatic representations anymore of the re recessive gene coming forth like we did with Esau and Jacob, you know, twins in the same womb having extremely different images. We don't really see that as much anymore, I don't think. Not so extreme. 
but notice the red hair marker and the beast-like nature. We know that Cain, obviously people have theorised he could have had a horn and been beast-like in nature. And it was said in the book of Jasher that he was slain by Lamech here, who this book is about, and his son Tubal Cain, as a beast in the field. They mistook him for an animal and shot him with an arrow and killed Cain. Because, um, like I said, he had an animal-like visage. He was a hairy beast. Not unlike, let's say, Esau may have manifested as well. So this goes into all sorts of deep, deep questions and thoughts about, you know, the serpent seed and the, the idea that even Cain wasn't actually a child of Adam, but a child of the serpent. Now, I'm not here to say that the serpent was the devil or Satan. You know, um, it seems like there may have been possibly an upright walking serpentine race around during that time of the Garden of Eden. And, you know, these were the, let's say, children of the Watcher's angels, the Seraphim angels, or perhaps just a race that existed at that, during this weird, this weird time, the reptilian race, you know. And they, were, they, they had legs and arms and appendages and walked upright. And it seems like it was those who talked to Eve and convinced them that, you know, they can eat of, eat of the fruit, partake of the knowledge type of thing. And the curse was to then wander on their belly and eat dust which is interesting because it implies that they're having their limbs removed, you know. Um, but I, who knows? Who knows on that? That is all wild, pure speculation as to what the serpent was exactly. But people have argued that, you know, the real issue there was that Eve got pregnant by the serpent and then gave birth to Cain, you know. And it was only until um, Abel was born did Adam say, you know, I've had a son in my own image made, which is interesting. Um, but again, we can't fully know that. But it's interesting that it was said, you know, as punishment that God would put enmity between the woman's seed and the serpent's seed. You know, and the serpent will bite the, bite the heel, but, you know, the woman's seed will bruise its head. And it's this idea that there'll be this eternal struggle between the serpent, people though who have the serpent mark within them, and those who, you know, are of pure blood, basically, of pure human and nature. Now, I don't know if that still goes on today because obviously the flood, the whole point of that was to wipe out that corruption and start from scratch. But this whole book of Lamech here brings forth the notion that it was Noah's wife who continued the corruption into the after the flood and then through the line of Ham. Um, but it was recessive then. It didn't appear in all humans. Only, obviously, out of the three sons, it was Ham and then it went on from there. So it's just, it's just food for thought. Like I said, this is a rumination. I don't have definitive answers here. But the main takeaway from this is that the Mark of Cain, if it was leprous whiteness during this antediluvian time, now this isn't Caucasian white skin. I'm talking vampire white, deathly white, ghostly white, you know, like a dead body type of white. Um, then this might be an indicator as how the Nephilim had white skin and red hair themselves. Um, if Esau had red hair and he is of, you know, the serpent uh, lineage, then it's possible Cain also had the same fiery red hair inherited from the fallen angels. Um, and the leprous white skin marker, the white skin red hair is obviously a clown motif. That's how it's relevant to my book. Could it be a possible answer as how we have the white skin? I mean, if I go to my book here, I say something like this. Um, I can find it. So the base image we're sculpting here for the Nephilim form is now partly coming into focus. According to biblical sources, the Nephilim were incredibly tall monsters with booming voices that distilled fear into whoever heard them. Their countenance was terrifying to witness and their bodies were shaped unlike anything else that is or ever has been on the face of the earth. They had extra fingers and extra toes. Though it's not made clear what the dexterous advantages of this deformity would have been, in a modern context, I imagine the words per minute typing speed was incredible. Through extra biblical sources, we can read that they also had brilliant and sickly white skin, with the colour red, and possibly other colours, patterned throughout, like a reptile or other brightly coloured animal. They also had hair that may have been white like Noah, or crimson and red like Esau. Finally, just like Noah was described again, they had large eyes that glowed, possibly through a form of bioluminescence, divine power, or simple reflectivity. As discussed in previous chapters, mankind did change themselves to be like Nephilim, 
by mixing themselves with animals. The forms these beasts took would have been innumerable, and many of these abominations, along with the giant offspring of fallen angels, were considered gods among men. So just to clarify there, you know, when Noah was born, according to Book of Enoch, his father Lamech, so this is the good Lamech, was terrified because he thought he had given birth to a Nephilim. Or he thought his wife, his wife had given birth to an angel child from the Nephilim, from the Watchers. So, however, but this isn't the case. Noah was, was divine and fine and normal. He was just a divine in nature because he was going to be the future of mankind, I think. But the way he's described must be similar to the Nephilim if his father Lamech was terrified that that, has, that is what had happened, you know. And Noah's described as having um, red and white patterned skin with immaculate white curly hair and glowing eyes. So the serpent, you know, so again, it must, it must be that the Nephilim also had glowing eyes, brightly colored hair, and also this, um, this white and red pattern on the skin. Interesting, interesting, you know, but obviously I do think the, the, the Nephilim version was much darker and twisted and more mangled like a beast rather than looking divine and lovely and, and brilliant to see, you know, um, that, which was, which obviously was the difference between God's lineage and, uh, the cursed lineage. But yeah, interesting thoughts there. Um, I don't know, what, what do you think of this Mark of Cain? Do you have any ideas? Um, again, this is all just speculative. This is all just taking the information for what it is and, and taking the good with the bad. You know, burning the, the wheat, with, uh, you know, separating the, the wheat from the chaff type of thing here. Um, if Have you read the book that I've mentioned here, the book of Lamech of Cain? If you haven't, it's, it's short. It's definitely a fascinating read. It adds a, a new perspective to the antediluvian world. It definitely shows how the antediluvian world was an incredibly corrupt and horrific place to be and exist at the time. Um, it's an eye, eye opener for sure. Um, there's lots of stuff I haven't mentioned about what happens in this. It's, it's, a, it's an epic tale. Again, it's quite short, as you can see here. It's only about 30 pages. Um, but yeah, guys, I'm going to leave that there. Um, I have released this full chapter, chapter 12, for my patrons only. So if you're a patron, you can go over and you can read the whole thing I've written here, um, this chapter. I'm going on to write chapter 13 now. I've written a few things there. Um, in regards to um, how the cultural descriptions of gods are throughout all cultures. Um, and then the next chapter will be modern encounters with giants. Uh, so things like the Lovelock Cave incident and the uh, giant of Kandahar will go into this chapter. And then that's section two boxed off. And then we're on to section three, which is all about the clown. The history of the clown, the symbolism of a clown, how it represents the Nephilim, um, the circus, the hat man, the ringmaster. DMT jesters, sacred clowning, it's all going to get referenced in the next chapter. But in this, you know, this, this section here where I'm just trying to describe what we can gather about the way they looked first, um, yeah, I, I think this source of having a white-skinned mark of Cain is an interesting addition to the theory. So thanks for listening, guys, and as always, God bless. I want you to get together.